Today on Golf Destination, we look at the brilliant fall colors at Lake Winnipesaukee Golf Club. Ray Cronin from Club Benchmarking explains how his company makes private golf clubs run more efficiently. We tour some of our favorite opening holes. We also recap the Rhode Island Amateur and Sean Hester has some tips before you even pick up a club. Welcome to Golf Destination. I'm Meredith Gorman here in the sociable DGI Communications Studio. The Lake Winnipesaukee Golf Club was founded in 2004 and it only continues to get better as it matures. The Lake Winnipesaukee Golf Club is located on 700 acres of land in both New Durham and Wolfboro, New Hampshire. The course opened the first tee in 2004 and it was all the vision of entrepreneur Bernard Chu. Bernard signed international golf architect and former European tour player Clive Clark to lay out this par 72 track. This pristine layout flows through the tall mature pines with amazing views of the presidential mountain range and several lakes from the lakes region. The course, however, is more than just pristine conditions and beautiful views. It's a course that offers plenty of birdies, but can also have you writing a six or seven or eight on your card as well. Clark and Chu worked closely throughout the process, and it shows. Clark, the professional, was keen enough to listen to Chu as he offered his perspective having a handicap in the teens. Many of those who have the opportunity to play it always leave with the memory of hitting out of the white silica sand from Georgia or the many risk-reward holes that have heightened and ruined many around. The course is a championship layout and it has hosted four New England Opens, as well as many state championships, including the Mid-Amateur Championship. Golf writer David DeSmith knows a thing or two about golf courses, having traveled around the globe playing some of the world's best. In David's mind, Lake Winnipesaukee ranks right up there. The things that characterize Lake Winnipesaukee Golf Club are the elevation changes. You are constantly playing downhill or uphill, uh, and often on the same hole. I think there are only two flattish holes on the entire course. So oftentimes you're hitting downhill off the tee and then uphill on your second shot. The par threes are all downhill or uphill. Uh, it's, it's like playing three-dimensional chess. You have to be thinking three dimensions and, and really play all the shots. It's, it's a terrific design and uh, a lot of different tee boxes they use on different days also. So a lot of variety, the routing is terrific. And the, the club overall just has a great vibe. It's, it's really low key, it's friendly, and it's in one of the most beautiful places you'll ever see. Every year, Lake Winnipesaukee Golf Club is rated as one of the best in a very competitive field of upscale private courses. And it's no wonder, as the magnificence of the course transcends into the fantastic New England style clubhouse with its custom made furniture and finishings. Now, let's take a look at the front nine at the Lake Winnipesaukee Golf Club. The first hole is an ideal opening hole. Play an iron off this tee from this elevated par four, or if you feel it from the range, pull out the driver and try to reach the green. The second hole is a solid three shot par five, but can be reached in two. Its name is Bottleneck, as a hazard creeps into the fairway on your second shot. The third is a dogleg right. Land safely in the fairway and you will have an uphill shot to the green. Be wary of front pin placements. If you are short or have spin, you'll roll down to the fairway. Four is named Silica because of the sand that protects this downhill par three. It can play over 200 yards, so club selection is the key. The fifth is the number one stroke hole on the course, and it is a dog leg left with hazard protecting the left side of the fairway. Bite off as much as you dare. The sixth is turtle shell, and it plays a little uphill with a somewhat narrow green with sand protecting the front and the back. The seventh is a double bender, as its name would suggest. Long hitters will have the opportunity to go for it in two with a good drive. The green is subtle and very tricky.
No mere human gets to the green in two on the par 5-8. Three good shots are required with the approach playing a little less than the number. The ninth is a straightforward par 4 of about 350 yards. Your approach needs to be accurate or you'll have a deep bunker shot. Now let's take a look at the back nine of the Lake Winnipesaukee Golf Club. You start off the back much like you started off your round with a downhill par four that is reachable with a good tee ball. The green is the trickiest on the course. The 11th offers two sets of tees with slightly different angles. The tee on the right side brings the trap more into play. Just be on the correct side of the spine in the middle of the green. The 12th named sliver is a solid par four. You'll have more landing area than what you see on the tee. The green is protected by bunkers and is positioned little left to right. Tombstone is a fun go for broke par five that plays downhill. Hit over rocks on the left side and you may have a mid iron into the green or your ball may go into its final rest. The approach is over a hazard and bunker. The 14th is a dog leg left. Right to left ball flight is a must to ensure that you don't have a long iron into a tough green. The 15th is another fabulous par three. It's short, but with the swirling wind, it's sometimes difficult to judge. 16 is called Double T, aptly named because it has two tee boxes. The low tee box plays as a tough dogleg right to an elevated green. The hillside green is a picture postcard as you use the canoe as your aiming point for your tee ball. You won't see the bottom of the pin, so trust your yardage on your approach. The 17th is a dogleg right that has danger everywhere. Get it up onto the fairway and have a 200 yard approach. Favor the left side of the fairway. This green is slick. The 18th is a fun uphill finish hole framed by the beautiful clubhouse. Your approach again is to a slightly uphill green and the green breaks left to right. We look at some of our favorite opening holes and Ray Cronin from Club Benchmarking tells us how they help private clubs. All of that and more when Golf Destination returns. Dare to smile and laugh out loud, to go to the beach instead of the office, to wear sneakers instead of heels, or heels instead of sneakers, to wear white after Labor Day and sunglasses at night. Dare to say no or yes take a long bath or a short walk, to have dessert for dinner or to grill in the snow. <laughs> dare to have fun. And most of all, dare to be happy. Galsing's Rep. Happy since 1806. If sweat is your body's natural way of cooling itself down, then condensation is a beer's natural way of saying, drink me. Michelob Ultra, superior light beer. A club benchmarking capital reserve study arms you with a precise chronological roadmap of capital requirements and associated costs. Our process includes a thorough financial analysis in-depth staff interviews, and an on-site inspection to evaluate, document, and prioritize your club's capital repair and replacement requirements over a rolling 20-year timeline. Club Benchmarking, your partner on the path to data-driven leadership.
Golf Destination is brought to you in part by Goslings of Bermuda. Dare to be happy. Welcome back to Golf Destination. I'm Meredith Gorman here at the Sociable DGI Communication Studio. What makes a good opening golf hole? Is it a par three, a par four, a par five? Well, we don't know the answer to that one, but we do know a good one when we see one. We start our look at opening holes with a course that we mentioned earlier, the Lake Winnipesaukee Golf Club. Flying high is just that, a downhill par four that can be tipped out to 364 yards. Long hitters will look to drive the green from the blue tees, while others will simply use a long iron to start their round. The next great opening hole is the par 5 first at the Copperhead Course at Innisbrook in Palm Harbor. It's a dogleg right par 5 of over 560 plus yards. Your tee shot is downhill where bunkers come into play, but the hole goes uphill a bit as you wind your way through the protected green. The first hole at PGA National Resort and Spa's Champion Course is a good way to start your round. Driver isn't necessary on this 365 yard par 4. Water is down the left side and out of bounds looms on the right next to the driving range, but it offers a generous landing area. The green is protected by sand and the green has a good deal of movement on it. TPC Tampa Bay has a slight dogleg right par 4 for your opening stanza at the course. It measures 395 yards from the tips, but most will play it between 340 to 360 yards. One deep bunker fronts the green, while shots that are hit long will require a delicate chip to save par. Cape Cod Country Club's first hole is a great way to start your round. The Devereaux, Emmett, and Alfred Toll design is pure traditional golf. You really only need to hit a 200 to 220 yard shot off the tee to leave you with an uphill approach of just over 100 yards. Bunkers protect the left and right side of the green. Historic Worcester Country Club checks in with a great opening hole. The downhill par four that measures up to 387 yards, but is generally played in the mid 300s. A stream bisects the fairway and awaits misjudged tee balls. The first hole at Salem Country Club tests you right out of the gate. The Donald Ross design gem starts with a 398 yard par four that requires a straight tee shot off of the tee. Stay down the left side of the fairway to avoid being blocked out to a tricky green, which is better played below the pin. Now we have Ray Cronin joining us from Club Benchmarking. And Ray, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Thank you. Now, when you first started working with Club Benchmarking, did you ever expect the organization to be so vested in as many clubs as you guys are today? We hope for it. I don't know if we expected it, but we're very happy we are. <laughs> it's a great thing. We have a good cross section of the entire industry. And what are the steps that Club Benchmarking uses to make sure that there is data driven leadership? Well, we start by gathering the data, and we gather all facets of data now across the entire operation of the club. I think that's the first step. The, the next step is to use the data to learn and provide the insight, and then finally to disseminate it, which means ultimately education of the board member and the staff of the club and the membership at large. Now, after all these years, do you still learn something when you go to a new club? I learn some, Honestly, I learn something every day, and I think that's a critical piece of the puzzle. I think it's a great question. It, 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 th there may be a tendency to think that the club industry, it's not that difficult, it's not that big, but, but the reality is it's a very complex business and we've been doing it for 12 years. We've only, I feel like we've only scratched the surface, frankly. And now you've met with general managers and the boards of hundreds of clubs. So how similar would you say the problems are from club to club? I'd say they're very similar, very common. Um, one of the one of the common problems is each club thinks that they're unique, which isn't actually the case. There's unique attributes of clubs, but to your point and your question, which is right on, if the challenges and the opportunities are very similar across all clubs. So it seems like more than anything, this is a labor of love 
And is it a factor, a mix of golf and data? How exactly does it work? Oh, I, I love golf. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. And I guess I love data too. So yeah, I'd say one plus one equals two there. It is a labor of love. It takes a lot of work. It's a very fragmented industry. There's clubs all across North America and in the United States. And honestly, we're trying to work with all of them. And when you go and visit clubs around the country, does it feel like a consulting visit at first or how do you go about it? That's a great question as well. I, I don't, we don't think of ourselves as consultants. We think of ourselves more as, I guess, uh, data scientists that use that data to educate. So, I, you know, we're very much into partnerships and forming partnerships. Um, I think the, the key is we visit the clubs, we form the partnership, and then to your earlier question, we learn together from that point forward. Well, Ray, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Once again, Ray Cronin from Club Benchmarking. Thank you. Up next, Don Coyne recaps the Rhode Island State Amateur when golf destination returns. Dare to smile and laugh out loud, to go to the beach instead of the office, to wear sneakers instead of heels, or heels instead of sneakers, to wear white after Labor Day and sunglasses at night. Dare to say no or yes, to take a long bath or a short walk, to have dessert for dinner or to grill in the snow. Dare to have fun. And most of all, dare to be happy. Galsing's Rep, happy since 1806. They're trapped in your attic, your basement, even your closet. Your precious family memories fading away on obsolete technology. Convert those time-worn family treasures at Retromedia, New England's media conversion specialists. We'll digitally restore those old home movies, videotapes, audio recordings, slides and photos to DVD, CD or computer files. Trust your family history to locally owned Retromedia. That is what Retromedia is all about. We make memories last. A club benchmarking Capital Reserve study arms you with a precise chronological roadmap of capital requirements and associated costs. Our process includes a thorough financial analysis, in-depth staff interviews, and an on-site inspection to evaluate, document, and prioritize your club's capital repair and replacement requirements over a rolling 20-year timeline. Club Benchmarking, your partner on the path to data-driven leadership. It's about more than boating. It's about the boating lifestyle. From the distinguished yachtsman to the day sailor and cruising family, join hosts Sierra Goodwill and John Methia for The Drift. It's new adventures and places to explore. It's the latest gadgets, newest technology, and safety tips you'll use. It's The Drift, and it's about the best in boating. Brought to you by Boat US. Get The Drift. Club Benchmarking, your partner on the path to data-driven leadership. Visit our website, golfdestination.tv. It's our hub for all of our social media platforms and scheduled airings. And also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because you never know what you may find. Welcome back to Golf Destination. I'm Don Coyne. The 116th Rhode Island Amateur at Kirkbrae Country Club got off to a wet start and would battle rain all week. Tuesday, the first of two stroke play rounds where the top 32 would qualify for match play. Kirkbrae member and winner, the last time the event was played here at Kirkbrae, Tom McCormick with a four under 68. I'm just trying to, you know, make good swings, make good putts, and get into match play. And that's really it. I don't think about favorites. That's your guy's job to do. Golfers scrambling to get into the top 32 to advance to match play. Plus, to determine the medalist. The honor went to former champion Kevin Silva by two shots over Andrew O'Leary. Everything in the races going into match play and all, you know, you're facing against the one guy you're playing against the rest of the week. Friday, the round of 16. Point Judas McKinley Slade thrived early, going three under on the front and able to hold on against medalist, top seed, and former champ Kevin Silva. The top seed knocked out two and one. The quarterfinals were completed and halfway through the semifinals before the skies opened up. Nearly four inches of rain in a week helped to make the final day, already a day late, a very long one. 
Semifinals needed to be finished before the 36 hole final. All four semifinalists, former champs, last year's runner up and 2019 champion Andrew O'Leary, playing out of Pawtucket and from Notre Dame, four up on defending champ Jamie Lukowitz at the turn. It comes to an end on 13. O'Leary with revenge for losing to Lukowitz in the finals a year ago. That feels great again, third year straight. You got a little revenge on last year's finals? I got a little revenge, yeah. Jamie, I know, didn't play his best, and, you know, it was kind of a bummer, but, you know, he's I expect him to be back next year for sure. After an hour and 15 minute delay, the second semifinal resumed. McCormick wins 14 to tie the match, and then the long par saver on 15 to help keep the match tied. Until Leopold drove the par 4 16th, a two putt birdie gave him a one up lead. Bobby Leopold, the 2009 and 2014 Rhode Island Amateur Champ, Leopold advances for a 2019 finals rematch with O'Leary. Finals first nine, they played one, two, and then 12 through 18 to let some of the front nine holes dry out. Leopold four up through the first nine. Played just so steady all day. I knew that I was going up against Andrew and knew I needed to play pretty much flawless golf and I, I, I did that today and that's uh, feels really good. Try to make birdies and just try not to make any mistakes and not make any bogeys. I don't think I made a bogey today so it was pretty good. On 14, Leopold able to make a bird and O'Leary couldn't match. Leopold avenges his loss in the finals to O'Leary in 2019 to win another Rhode Island State Amateur Golfing Championship. It's pretty crazy. It's not easy to, to win this and you know put myself up there and in contention enough times now and it was the you know it's pretty satisfying it's been a long time since i got this thing back but it feels good to get it for golf destination i'm don coin thanks don up next sean hester has a tip for you on how to be ready to take that first swing Golf Destination is brought to you in part by Goslings of Bermuda. Dare to be happy. Welcome back to Golf Destination. I'm Meredith Gorman here at the Sociable DGI Communications Studio. Now, do you run from your car to the first hole as your warm up before you play golf? That might not be the best idea. Sean Hester joins us now to share some stretching exercises that you might want to do before you hit the links. When you hit 50 something, it can be a very humbling thing when you get up in the morning and you feel like, geez, I don't know if I can make it to the bathroom in one piece. So as golfers, we need to get our body ready for action. Fran's going to show us some of the things he does to prepare for a round on the Champions Tour. He's got his foam roller here. And first thing he does when he goes to the course is he rolls that back out. Any golfer that's played the game for 30 some odd years is gonna have some back issues. And you've gotta keep your body strong and limber to stay in the game. He does some other exercises here on a daily basis. And Fran's found what works for his body and I think that's really important. You obviously need to work with someone that's gonna help you define the areas that you need work with. And he'll also do some squats. He'll do those on both sides. And again, this is in preparation to get his body ready to perform. And these are just some of the things that he goes through on a daily basis to get ready to play. And don't forget this standby. We all need some of this at times. Okay, so keep your bodies in shape. See someone that can help you, a physical therapist that can help define what areas of your body you need to work on in order to stay fit and stay able to play this great game. Thanks for joining us on Golf Destination and make sure to check out our website, golfdestination.tv. It's our hub for our social media and broadcast schedules, so make sure to check it out. We'll see you next time.
golf destination is brought to you in part by Goslings of Bermuda, dare to be happy. Club Benchmarking, your partner on the path to data-driven leadership.